This episode contains graphic content that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Victorian England. A city gripped by fear. A gruesome killer, leaving a series of women horribly mutilated. The most notorious serial killer of all time. Jack the Ripper. Now, on the other side of the world, Australian scientists have made a major breakthrough. For the first time ever, they've extracted DNA from a suspect in the Jack the Ripper case. A forensic detective is on the hunt for evidence, heading a team of world experts on a cutting-edge investigation. His mission, to find out could an Australian killer be Jack the Ripper? In the autumn of 1888, a brutal predator stalked the streets of London. His victims, a series of prostitutes in the poverty-stricken area of Whitechapel. The murders would have become the most famous unsolved crimes in history. Eleven murders were investigated. Five were believed to be the work of the same killer. Over 100 suspects have been put forward. From a prince to a North American, from a royal doctor to a Polish Jew none have ever been proved conclusively. But why was this monster never caught? Former Scotland Yard detective and forensic expert Robin Knapper wants to put one man under the microscope, a suspect that's never been seriously investigated before, Frederick Bailey Deeming. British-born, Deeming became infamous as Australia's first serial killer. In a recent investigation into the identity of this skull, DNA was extracted, and it was believed to be that of Frederick Deeming. If Deeming is the Ripper, modern forensics may finally be able to catch the killer. What makes Deeming's case so interesting is this high-profile killer has flown under the radar for so long. To build his case, Napper must first examine the scenes of the crimes, Body had been extensively establish a solid motive, identify the method of killing, build a criminal profile, and finally nail forensic evidence. We need to look at this man's timelines. We need to look at where he's travelled to, where he's travelled from. You don't wake up every morning and turn into a serial killer. There is a build-up of how they act and how they operate. And that's what we've got to try and find with Deeming. What he discovers will rock the Ripper case to its foundations. The confession is so terrible and startling of nature that it is almost inconceivable. Napa has come to Windsor, an inner suburb of Melbourne, to examine the scene of a brutal murder. It was here, Christmas 1891, that Deeming battered his wife to death. The victim, Emily Mather from Rainhill, England. Let me uh, introduce Napa you. Napper meets Christopher Ray, lawyer and co-author of The Scarlet Thread, about Australia's Jack the Ripper, Frederick Deeming. That's the hearth in the second bedroom where the uh, body of Emily Mather was oh, found. Right taken shortly after the body was exhumed. And, and the body would have been found there? Buried uh, under a slab of concrete. What was the cause of death, Chris? She was severely bashed around the head and her throat was cut. The last person to see Emily alive was a passerby by the name of Louisa Atkinson. And uh, that statement refers to hearing an argument and then a conversation that she had with Emily. Emily said to her, it will be all right soon. And Louisa says, advises her to leave the house. So, woman's intuition, Chris. Yeah, but unfortunately, Emily didn't take her advice. Deeming had prepared for the murder, 
purchasing cement and tools a few days earlier to dig Emily's grave. It's almost as if Demi had this master plan in his mind about what he was going to do to this poor woman. Deeming went on the run. He was finally cornered in Southern Cross on the goldfields of Western Australia, posing as an aristocrat, Baron Swanson. But police were soon to discover it wasn't the first time he'd killed. In his home country of England, news of Deeming's arrest led police there to uncover an even more horrific crime, one that would elevate him from a one-off murderer to a cold-blooded serial killer. This house, in a quiet and respectable street outside Liverpool, England, once hid a horrific past. Known as Dinham Villa, it was here, around August 1891. Deeming murdered his first wife, Marie, and three of their children, cutting their throats, and a fourth strangled. He had murdered his first wife and four children at Rainhill in Lancashire and buried their bodies under the kitchen floor in the house there. Within a month of killing his family, he married Emily Mather under the alias Albert Williams and the newlyweds set sail for Australia. Deeming believed he had got away with mass murder. To find out more about the elusive Frederick Deeming, Napa tracks down a rare collection of memorabilia. Kind of a cross between a collection of news articles and a popular sensational novel. It talks Rachel about Weaver is a Deeming expert. It has dialogue in it. It has yeah. uh, Deeming talking to his victim as he murders her. There's a little chapter which includes the murderer's honeymoon, early quarrels, and then the idea of Jack the Ripper yeah. is introduced. Because of the extraordinary brutality of the murders and the media frenzy that surrounded them, the public increasingly believed he was Jack the Ripper. Australia wanted to have, you know, a really top-class export quality criminal of their own. So who was this villain? Frederick Bailey Deeming was born in 1853 in Leicestershire, England, son of Anne Bailey and tradesman Thomas Deeming. It was reported he had an unnaturally strong relationship with his mother and that his father spent time in a mental asylum. At 16 years of age, he ran away to sea and began a long career of crime as a fraudster, masquerading as a member of the respectable classes. The idea that he was a middle-class imposter who wore diamonds, impressed people, yeah. conned them and took them in, yeah. that was almost treated with as much indignation in the press as his actual crimes. With so much press speculation, Napa searches for more reliable reports. What he's about to find will shock him and take his investigation into overdrive. The confession is so terrible and startling of nature that it is almost inconceivable. This 1892 newspaper article reports a confession by Deeming to some of the Ripper murders. Deeming has himself owned up to being the perpetrator of the last two of the Whitechapel atrocities. How extraordinary. What is interesting for me is they are now linking it to somebody within the police service itself. It was claimed this explosive confession was made to a Detective Causey who was part of the team that had extradited Deeming back to Victoria. Napa heads to Old Melbourne Jail, where Deeming was incarcerated. We're heading towards the gallows area now. Oh, they've still got the rope hanging. Sylvia Campbell is the jail's researcher, who has an intimate knowledge of Deeming's fate. So this is where... Mr. Deeming Mr. met his Deeming. Lionel in. Yes, at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. That was a popular time for executions. An hour before his hanging on the 23rd of May, 1892, Deeming was led into this small waiting room beside the gallows. Here, Napper discovers a curious inconsistency 
in the jail records. 1892, Albert Williams, alias Frederick Demon. If you look at everyone else on here, they're all executed in their own names, and he's the only man on the chart who's been executed yes. under an alias. His last night would have been in cell block one. He was then marched up those stairs and into this cell next to the gallows. He would have had a drink of alcohol and a cigar, I believe, he also asked for. The hangman would have come across, taken Deeming out, stood him on the gallows and tied him up, hands behind his back, legs tied together and hood over his head, rope round the neck with the knot of the rope under the left jawbone. That was considered to be the point that gave the quickest death. It's what happened to Deeming's body after execution which might bring me a step closer to the Ripper. After notorious criminals were executed, death masks were often made. The head and face were shaved and wax used to make a mold. When that was set, it was cut off in two pieces, rejoined, filled with plaster, and that's an exact copy of Deeming's head. Could the death mask of this known serial killer help the Ripper investigation? Napper's quest takes him to London, where the grisly murders began. I'm back here at Scotland Yard. I haven't been here for 30 years since I worked here. What I want to do is to find out whether or not they took Deeming as a serious suspect for the Jack the Ripper murders. Napper heads inside Scotland Yard's famous crime museum. Access is strictly limited to serving and former police officers. Among the museum's gory exhibits, Napper discovered something quite unexpected. Another copy of Deeming's death mask. I found out that when Deeming's death mask was displayed, it was always referred to visitors as the face of Jack the Ripper. Now, that's really important to me because it shows that at the time, the Metropolitan Police took him as a serious suspect for the Jack the Ripper murders, and I'm on the right track. It's great news for the investigation, but if Scotland Yard's crime museum thought Deeming was Jack, why was he never properly investigated? I want to know why. To find out, I need to start with the scenes of the crimes. Napper meets up with ripperologist Donald Rumbelow, a ripper expert. Uh, this is uh, Derwood Street, but in 1888 the name of the street was Bucks Road. And this was the scene of the first uh, Jack the Ripper murder at about 3.40 in the morning. The victim was a prostitute called uh, Polly Nichols. The date, the 31st of August, 1888. She'd been out on the main road sort of looking for customers earlier on, but she was confident of getting a new customer because she was wearing a new hat. What I'm looking for are patterns in the grisly murders which might lead me to deeming. Nichols' throat had been cut twice and several incisions found across her abdomen. Then, just a week later, the body of another prostitute was found. This was the, the murder that really ignites the Jack the River case. Annie Chapman's body was discovered in a backyard in Spitalfields, East London. With Chapman, you get the mutilation. She'd been ripped open, intestines lifted out and dropped to one side of the body, and the murderer had cut away her uterus and two-thirds of her bladder. This was called Burner Street, and this was the location of the third of the murders. This was the murder of Elizabeth Stride, nicknamed Long Liz. Stride's throat was cut, yeah. but there were no other mutilations. Nothing else. That was Nothing the else. It's believed the Ripper was interrupted and went in search of another prostitute to satisfy his bloodlust. Within half an hour, he'd found another victim because she knows there's a policeman on this beat once every 15 minutes. She knows... In that short are. space of time, another horrific murder was committed. Catherine Eddowes. 
gruesomely, her nose was severed. A lot of women had syphilis, and the end tip of the nose rotted. Oh. So what you could actually buy was a false nose to conceal this disfigurement. What it was doing was branding her as a prostitute. Could Deeming have had something against prostitutes? Was he this type of killer? He had then cut out and taken away a kidney yep. and the uterus. This, uh, Rumbelow brings Napa to the scene of the most brutally mutilated of the five Ripper victims, Mary Jane Kelly. The throat had been cut, the face had been skinned down to the skull. Just the flesh was stripped from different parts of her body. I found out that it was highly likely Kelly's murderer used an axe and several different knives, the same type of weapons Deeming used to kill his second wife. In Australia, at the Police and Justice Museum in Sydney, another of Frederick Deeming's weapons has been identified. His initials, FD, clearly engraved on the pommel of this dagger. When Deeming was arrested for the murder of Emily Mather, he had over 20 knives and other weapons in his possession. Clear evidence he carried an arsenal of weapons. But the case for Deeming being Jack the Ripper could be over before it's even begun. Over the years, numerous books have documented that Deeming should be ruled out as a suspect because he was in jail at the time of the Ripper murders. I want to find out if that's true. If Deeming was behind bars during the Whitechapel murders, it explains why he's never been properly investigated. Ripper enthusiast Mike Covell has researched Deeming's stint in prison here at Hull Jail, Northern England. Is this still the same building, the same place yeah, he would have come uh, into? the external features are very much the same. The original clock tower uh, can still be seen. Um, Mike tells me Deeming ended up in jail after being convicted of fraud under the name Harry Lawson. He'd been tracked down in South America and extradited to the United Kingdom. The question is, when? This is from September 1890, and on the 26th, you can see under the alias of Harry Lawson, is admitted to the Holborough jail. This proves Deeming wasn't jailed until two years after the Ripper murders. But could he have been jailed under another alias? Do we know how many names, Mike, that Deeming was using around about this time? In the region of about 20 different aliases. 20. I've been able to search criminal registers, yeah. registers of inmates, uh, and to date, none of his aliases have ever appeared um, in jails prior to this, other than when he was in Australia. It shatters the myth that Deeming was in jail during the Ripper murders. He was free to stalk the streets after all. Whitechapel was near the Docklands in London. Napa has established Deeming was a seafarer and therefore likely to have known the area. But was he there at the time of the murders? On one of his voyages, early in the 1880s, he jumped ship in Sydney. Within a year, he'd been jailed for theft and by 1887, declared bankrupt and jailed again for perjury. At the beginning of 1888, it seemed Deeming left Australia for Cape Town where he continued his life of theft and fraud. But if Deeming was in South Africa in 1888, I need to prove he was back in England by the time the Ripper murders began in August of that year. This is a report that claims that Deeming arrived in Birkenhead, Liverpool in 1888. And if this is correct, it's very important because it places Deeming in England at the time of the Ripper murders. Even if he was in the country, could he have done it? The problem is Deeming was known to have killed only family members. Napa turns to a criminal profiler to get beneath the skin of Frederick Deeming. Chris Illingsworth is FBI trained and has worked on violent and serious crime in Australia for the past 20 years. 
in stranger crimes there is no connection between the offender and the victim. So the offender really has no need, there is no imperative to conceal a victim because there's no connection between them. So while Deeming buried his victims and the Ripper didn't, they could still be carried out by the same person. What I need to find out are similarities between the killings. The signature, the ritualised behaviour, the fantasy-driven behaviour, sits on top of the modus operandi. And it is through the signature behaviour that we can link crimes. This need to overpower the victims quickly through cutting their throats and that's seen in each and every one of the crimes of Jack the Ripper and of Deeming. But there's one more crucial link. The Ripper is believed to have strangled some of his victims before cutting their throats. With Deeming's oldest child, Bertha, she was strangled. So certainly Deeming is very capable of strangling a victim. But there's a complication. I've always assumed that because the Ripper victims were prostitutes, the murders must have been sexually motivated. Where does that leave Deeming? Historians and Ripper experts alike have long believed there was no evidence of a sexual motive. But one serial killer expert in Australia disagrees and reveals a sensational new link between the Deeming and Ripper murders. Crime writer Amanda Howard has interviewed some of the world's worst serial killers face to face. She has a unique take on the Ripper murders. Many of Jack the Ripper's victims were found with their legs posed open in this manner. We can see that Jack more than likely stood between the victim's legs and mutilated them from this angle. What that would indicate is that it's entirely possible that Jack the Ripper actually raped his victims but the mutilations rendered any sort of identification impossible. The Ripper's rage was followed by a deliberate positioning of the victims and, in some instances, body parts. When we look at Annie Chapman's murder, he was calm enough to actually place several of her items on the floor between her legs to indicate a control and a power that he had over that victim. The Ripper murders were highly ritualistic. But what proof is there deeming engaged in this behaviour? When the body of his first wife, Marie, was uncovered, two of the murdered children had been arranged on either side, and the youngest at her feet. It's an amazing coincidence. The Ripper displayed items around his victims in the same way. But to prove Deeming was the Ripper, I still need to find a strong reason for why he may have committed these ghastly murders. His team in Australia continue to search for evidence. Lawyer Chris Ray locates original copies of Deeming's 1892 court transcripts. He makes a chilling discovery. A statement in the killer's own words, revealing he had contracted a sexually transmitted disease from a prostitute, syphilis. Deeming says that the woman who had given him syphilis had made a useless man of him for two years. It was right to kill such. He would have killed her and intended to kill her and would not have thought it murder. She deserved it. Could this be the motivation Napper's been looking for? It gives him a motive to murder prostitutes because he hates them. Disturbingly, long-term untreated syphilis can result in the inflammation of the brain and cause psychosis, leading to paranoia and violent outbreaks. Deeming is said to have had apparitions of his dead mother. Was it evidence of his psychosis? Or did something else trigger this explosion of violence? Chris Illingsworth has uncovered some fascinating clues. Deeming experienced a number of uh, stressing events during 1888. The birth of his child is certainly one of those things, and his health issues with syphilis would have been another stressor for him. The birth of a child should be a cause for celebration. 
but it turns out that it was also the year he claims to have contracted syphilis. Combine that with a life of crime and a history of mental illness in the family, Deeming was a ticking time bomb. But the investigation must now prove he was in London at the time of the Whitechapel murders. I've read Deeming's trial transcript, and in his own words to his counsel, he admitted that he was a regular visitor to London. The evidence stacks up. An 1892 article from the New York Times quotes Deeming's sister-in-law, claiming that while he was living in Birkenhead in 1888, Deeming made regular trips to London. This coincided with a new rail link, making it easier for him to get there. But that is not enough to say that Deeming was Jack the Ripper. Now, in a case like this, I would be looking for more eyewitness accounts of the murders. Can Napper find a star witness that puts Frederick Deeming at the center of Jack the Ripper's reign of terror? An accurate description of a suspect has always been one of the most crucial aspects of my detective work. I look for anything distinctive about their appearance. Today, new advances in forensic science are pushing the boundaries of these traditional techniques. Dr. Susan Hayes is a facial anthropologist. Most of the analysis is um, looking at how people's faces differ from one to the other. So we put landmarks on the faces into a computer. She brings the faces of dead people back to life. This is the average face of 70 men's faces. Over here, is where Deeming is sitting amongst that group. So there's everybody else, there's Deeming. With everybody else, Deeming. Dr. Hayes explains Deeming had several unusual features. This part of his face is actually quite forward, which makes his eyes deep set. Her analysis shows that Deeming not only had unusual eyes, he had a square-shaped face, which often goes with a solid build. According to a newspaper report in 1892, a London dressmaker recognised Deeming from a photograph after his arrest. She claimed she was with him in the Whitechapel area of London just hours before we know that the Ripper struck twice. This witness knew him by the name of Lawson, one of Deeming's known aliases. The dressmaker told the police that the next day, this man Lawson became very agitated when he read about the murders in the press. It's a major lead. Deeming's been seen in Whitechapel on the night of the double murder. In fact, there were many eyewitness accounts at the time. Napa compares them with Deeming. The Ripper was described as between 5 feet 5 and 5 feet 7. Deeming was 5 feet 6. He was also of solid build, with strange eyes, a light-colored mustache. He wore a hard felt hat, a chained watch, and a long overcoat. It's spooky how all of these things seem to appear in photographs we have of Deeming. With witness descriptions strengthening the case against Deeming, Napa needs to find hard evidence. The hunt for forensics begins. Sue. Hello, Robin. Lovely to meet you. And you. Andy and Sue Parler claim to have a rare artifact from the Ripper murders. Now, I understand that you've got a shawl from one of the Ripper victims. No, we haven't got the complete shawl, but what we have got is two framed pieces that were cut from the shawl. If you look at the back, it gives you a, an idea. It says two silk samples taken from Catherine Eddowes' shawl at the time of the discovery of her body by Constable Amos Simpson. Amos picked up the shawl at the scene of the murder, claiming to be the first policeman on the scene, 
and um, then he passed it to his niece, Eliza, and the shawl has been passed down through the family ever since. It's an extraordinary family legacy, supporting the authenticity of the shawl. But how can Napa be certain? And could it hold the killer's DNA, which can be matched back to the deeming skull? So the big question, where is the rest of the shawl if this is pieces of it? Well, we know where the rest of the shawl is. That's uh, with a certain gentleman by the name of Russell Edwards. I'm heading north to Birkenhead near Liverpool. It's the place where Deeming lived in 1888. It's also where I hope to find the shawl. I understand Russell Edwards has a personal interest in the case. This is my hometown, which is why I would found a very great interest in Frederick Bailey Deeming, as he lived here in this road. Russell bought Edo's shawl at auction for an undisclosed sum. The item is so valuable, he takes Napa to a secret location. Yeah, this looks identical to published reports at the time, and identical to the pieces that uh, Sue and Andy Parler have got. Now, would you agree to having it DNA tested, Russell? I would be more concerned with the damage uh, that would be done to the shawl. But, but you'll be taking the shawl in so you can explain that to the scientist himself. There wouldn't be any sign that anything has been done or tested no. on. No. OK, here's the exhibit. Thank you. Let's see what we've got. OK. The hope is this precious exhibit may help solve this notorious cold case. They seem to be the areas where we should, we should concentrate. One here, yeah. one there, one there, and one there. The scientists take swabs from stains in search of the killer's DNA. Can this expert team confirm the authenticity of the shawl and find forensic evidence linking Deeming? Will it prove once and for all he really was the monster behind the Whitechapel murders? Weeks later, the team get the results from the tests on the Ripper victim's shawl. In an exciting development, the experiment uncovers some remarkable new clues. Using infrared tests, the team discovers that the stains could be from a number of sources. One explanation is that the shawl was stained with multiple bodily fluids from the intestines, blood and feces when the victim was murdered. It's the first time ever scientific evidence has linked the shawl to the Ripper murders. However, attempts to find Deeming's DNA have failed. Contamination has delivered an inconclusive result. The investigation suddenly stalls. But the shawl isn't the only piece of evidence that could contain DNA of the killer. During the Ripper's reign of terror, some 600 letters were sent to newspapers and police claiming to have been written by the notorious killer. Taunting their efforts to catch him, these letters fed public fear. Many were considered hoaxes, but if I can find one letter that's genuine, it could finally solve the case. Now, there are three letters that are really important to me. The first one was sent on the 16th of October, 1888, and became known as the Lusk Letter. George Lusk was the chairman of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee during the Ripper murders. He received a letter and parcel containing a gruesome gift, half a human kidney allegedly belonging to one of the Ripper victims, Catherine Eddowes. But for Napa, there's a problem. The last letter was, uh, was lost before the letters were sent to the National Archives. Now, the second letter, which is important to me, uh, became known as the Dear Boss letter. It was sent to the Central News Agency. 
Now this looks promising. Oh, I think this is the one, look at it. There we are. Dear boss, I keep hearing the police have not caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. Uh, the next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for the jolly, wouldn't you? Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The letter predicts what injuries the Ripper plans to inflict on one of his victims. Three days later, it came horribly true. Catherine Eddowes had an earlobe cut off. Now, I find that both disturbing and also gives um, genuineness to the letter that this could well be one of the letters that was sent by Jack the Ripper. It's a tantalizing piece of evidence, but there's one letter that could provide the crucial link with Deeming. The forensic investigation now shifts to the other side of the world. Scottish-born scientist Professor Ian Finlay has developed a revolutionary DNA testing technique using minute samples. Conventional profiling tests need more than 200 cells, and our test needs very, very few cells, only single cells. This Ripple letter is one of the few believed to be genuine. As a result, it was selected for the experiment. Could it be the last chance to find DNA and match it to the deeming skull. What Professor Finlay discovers will rock the Ripper case to its core. In the hunt for DNA, the least contaminated area of this Ripper letter is under the stamp. The first step is to moisten it. That would release the stamp from the surface of the envelope. It's a delicate operation. Just swab the underside. Any cells will be transferred. After days of testing, at last Professor Finlay has a result. The DNA was contained a mixture of glue and saliva from the stamp surface. Finally, DNA has been extracted from the Ripper letter, and the result is explosive. We obtained a partial profile of the individual, and I was rather surprised that the DNA sample that we obtained was female. It's an extraordinary twist. Could Jack really be Jill the Ripper? It appears that at the time of the murders, Jill the Ripper was actually a credible theory. In fact, Frederick Aberline, the detective in charge of the case, actually raised the idea himself. But only one likely female suspect has been put forward. Mary Piercy was a midwife who, in a jealous rage, stabbed her lover's wife and child to death. I just don't buy the Jill the Ripper theory. Piercy's murder was a crime of passion. Napper has another hunch. He's on his way to Bath, where the world's first stamped letter was posted. Whitechapel probably had its own sorting frame. Historian Audrey Swindles has a detailed knowledge of the Victorian mail system. Maybe the DNA came from a female postal clerk. In the early days of the Victorian era, you would have stood outside in the street in all weathers and dealt with the clerk through the lower part of a Georgian window, and probably the clerk would have put the stamp on the letter. But by the time of the Whitechapel murders in 1888, things had changed. Just about anybody could buy a stamp and post it themselves. In 1888, were there any women employed by the post office? There were a lot of women telegraphists, but there were also some female clerks. And in a village, it's quite likely if you knew the person, you might have decided, oh, I'll put this on for you. But what if it was mailed in a city post office? In a big post office in London, no, they wouldn't have put the stamp on, they wouldn't have licked it. If it wasn't a female clerk, who else could it be? 
could well be Marie's DNA because it's not unknown that serial killers will get their wives or girlfriends to do their dirty deeds for them. So that was a very interesting turn up. Could Deeming's first wife, Marie, have unwittingly aided Deeming in the Ripper murders? To prove it, though, I would need Marie's DNA. Napper pulls together all the threads of the investigation. He has one last thing to do. In 1988, the FBI investigated the Jack the Ripper case and created a detailed criminal profile. This secret dossier was recently made public. Will Frederick Bailey Deeming fit the killer's profile? Jack the Ripper would be a male, Caucasian, aged 28 to 36 years old. Deeming was 35 years old at the time of the Ripper murders. He would come from a family where his mother was very domineering. And his father spent time in a lunatic asylum. The FBI profile also said that Jack the Ripper would carry a knife with him in case he was ever attacked, and that he would have suffered a venereal disease, and that it came from prostitutes. And Deeming admitted that it would have been justified to have killed the woman that gave him syphilis. Jack the Ripper would have been interviewed at some point during the course of the investigation. The detective that arrested Deeming claimed that he had been interviewed for the Ripper murders. Now, there's one more point. Credible Ripperologists believe that the Ripper was a seafarer. It's an extraordinary match. Deeming fits the FBI profile. All the evidence from my work points to Deeming being Jack the Ripper. With the investigation over, Napper pays his final respects. I'm looking for the graves of Marie and the four children, and we're told from church records it's on the perimeter of the gravesite, and it's between two headstones, three plots between two headstones. So it has to be in here. This is one of the tombstones. And there's another tombstone, and here we've got the three plots. This has got to be where Marie and the children are buried. What has got me about this case all the way through is the way that Deeming has flown under the radar. The man was gratuitously violent. But why he's never been taken seriously before is, quite frankly, beyond me. If Marie's DNA could be found, a match to this stamp, the last piece of the puzzle would be in place. Finally, forensics would provide the ultimate answer and prove Napper right. The Deeming was Jack the Ripper.